the type of outcome in light of this? No, I, I tried uh, in my remarks to towards the close to focus on the fact that we have to anticipate there'll be additional surprises. That you can by no means count him out yet, given the size force he has, that he uh, could try to find some way to surge his Air Force all at once or uh, go after targets that he's not gone after yet. As the chairman mentioned, we haven't really seen any aggressive military response by him to date. He's basically gone to ground and, and hunkered down. And the only safe assumption for us to make uh, especially when we're talking to the press is, you know, be cautious here. We're trying to be cautious, and no one wants to declare that uh, he no longer constitutes a threat. That, that would be a very serious mistake. Well, quick follow-up. So you think this could be a strategy, as many, many military analysts believe, to, to, to inflict maximum casualties? It, it could well be a strategy, and, and uh, based in part upon the fact that uh, he has not yet been able to find a way to deal with our capabilities. You mentioned, uh, General Powell mentioned two times uh, Soviet air defenses, Soviet Scud missiles. How much military cooperation are you getting from the Soviet Union in dealing with this? I want to answer that. <laughs> Good to be the boss. <laughs> no, all right. The um, uh, I had general discussions when I was in uh, Moscow in October, a meeting with um, senior Soviet officials and Marshal Yazov about the situation in the Gulf. Um, I think it would be fair to say that um, it was their view that Saddam Hussein did not possess any significant capability that we were unaware of. And they described the systems that they'd provided to him as uh, systems that were generally uh, available, uh, like T-72 tanks uh, to their allies. Uh, specifically, we talked about the Scud. Uh, he made it clear then that there was no guidance system for the Scud. It's just a ballistic missile that goes wherever it goes. It's, it's not a, a highly accurate or a very sophisticated system. Um, I think probably the greatest two contributions the Soviets have made to this venture. One has been their uh, cooperation and support of the policy in the United Nations, which has been very significant. And the other is that they have uh, shut off the flow of arms exports to Iraq. And the situation we're faced with today would be far more difficult if Saddam Hussein were able to get resupplied in terms of uh, the key pieces of military equipment that uh, we've been working to destroy. Sir, how effective have the Iraqis been at repairing the damage to their airfields and other targets? And how effective have they been at fooling you with decoys in their Scud missile department? Uh, they, they use decoys. They're quite good at it. Uh, I'll, I'll let the chart I used earlier as to which airfields are active uh, speak for itself. Um, they obviously are hard at work repairing some of the damage. We've seen it. We've also seen them paint damage on, air, on, on airfields to spoof us into thinking that there, it is still damaged and therefore we don't have to worry about it. Uh, there are also reports that they are trying to put out uh, dummy scud systems. This isn't a surprise to us because uh, they have a long history and did it throughout the Iran-Iraq war of using dummies in order to confuse their enemy. They probably are also uh, making some efforts to uh, take totally destroyed uh, facilities and cover them over quickly to make them appear as if they're not totally destroyed uh, to uh, lure us into coming back. But I think our analysts and our targeteers are, are quite sophisticated. They're the best in the world and uh, they will be sensitive to the uh, possibility of dummy installations and false repairs. Is there General, 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 General,
seven days of the war. They did not challenge us with defensive air. They have not tried to attack us with offensive air. But that does not mean we are not on the lookout for it, or we're not alert to it, or we are unmindful of the threat it represents. It does represent a threat, but it's a threat we understand, we believe we are uh, quite able to deal with, and rather than spend air power now trying to run the body cap body count up on airplanes that are not bothering us at the moment, I'd rather use that air power in more efficient ways against things that are more more immediate relevance to our battle plan. Mr. Mr. There, have been, uh, there have been reports that at least one other country in the area is providing a sanctuary for Iraqi aircraft or other equipment. Do you have any evidence at all to support or... Uh, or I've seen those that? reports and I can't confirm them. Mike, do you... Michael, uh, uh, General Powell, I'd like to ask you to expand a little bit on what you infer the Iraqi military strategy to be. You said it, what their actions could be part of a strategy. Does the Iraqi military response to date, that is, the absence of a response, surprise you? Were you surprised by that? Do you think it's an attempt to engage us in a costly land war? And a related question, General Powell said that implied that we hope not to have to use ground forces. At the same time, he said the Republican guards are will lie low, and that the only way we may determine if they survived attack is if they're forced to move. Does right. that mean we'll have to bring in our ground forces uh, in order to determine whether we've knocked them out? Don't know yet. The strategy right now, it seems to me, is they are they are hunkering down. I mean, that's it's obvious. They they uh, I suspect, and not not being an Iraqi general, I, I don't have complete insight into what they may be thinking. But I would I would suspect that right now they are hunkering down. And they probably uh, are questioning whether we can keep this up for an extended period of time and whether or not uh, the political will and public support will be there to keep this up for an extended period of time. And I'm sure they're making an assessment day by day on what their losses are and making their own judgment as to how long they can sustain uh, this kind of punishment. Um, I would be the happiest guy in the world if uh, one day uh, one bomb goes in on a Republican Guard unit and they say, that's it, we break, can't take anymore, we're heading home and they leave. But I can't plan on that. And so what I'm putting in place, and what, what General Schwarzkopf is putting in place, I should say, and, what, and the campaign plan that General Schwarzkopf has worked out, is to anticipate that at the end of the day, uh, when they are so weakened that uh, we believe the time is right and uh, air power alone won't do it, uh, we're prepared to take this to a successful conclusion using uh, other means of combat power besides air power. Sir, is this all, I've always, that's been a consistent... Is this the response that you anticipated in planning your campaign by the Iraqi I, military I, uh, low strategy? At this, I'd rather not say what I anticipated because it might give uh, Mr. Hussein some insight on what, into what I'm anticipating now. General, 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 General. Young ladies, I Mr. Secretary, can you tell us, you, you said a minute ago that uh, Saddam Hussein cannot change the basic course of this conflict, he will be defeated. Can you tell us, is there any reason to believe that he and his circle of, uh, of advisors believes that? Whether, uh, and what are you doing to make him believe that? And if you're not doing anything, why not? Well, I think um, uh, if it was difficult before the conflict started, to try to assess uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, mental attitude and, and his uh, thinking about all of these kinds of issues is probably even more difficult now. Uh, there's no press left in Baghdad, uh, very little diplomatic communication uh, through other countries. Uh, we know less today about what's going on inside uh, Saddam Hussein's mind than we did then, so it be risky business for us, I think, to, to make judgments about that. Uh, it may well be that he does not have as much information as we do about the m impact we've had on his forces, that having, in many cases, damaged his command and control system and, and had the impact that uh, Colin shows with respect to his air capability, etc., that he simply doesn't know uh, how badly he's been hit. And uh, I think ultimately he'll get the message. I would hope that he will. And, and, and we are determined, in terms of the statement I made, to achieve our military objective, which is to do what the President's directed us to do, which is to get Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. Is it part of the plan that he should not know in that, would you like to, to visit a, a minimum level of destruction, for instance, upon the, pre the Republican Guard before he knows it? Well, the, uh, it, it's difficult to refine it that carefully. I mean, once, once you start uh, military action, 
Uh, you can go after those specific targets we've laid out there, uh, but we believe the Republican Guard is at the heart of his his military capability and his his political power. That it, that's the the unit uh, that he used to take uh, Kuwait. Those are the units that he used in his war with Iran for offensive purposes. They are the heart of the regime, and we're not really trying to fine tune it. Uh, we'll hit the Republican Guard just as we ha hard as we have to until we've achieved our objective. Mr. Secretary, Mr. General, 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 we we know that he has in the past several. <coughs> Has demonstrated a capability to put salvos of scuds over major cities from Tel Aviv across uh, the area to the Persian Gulf. If he marries them now with chemical weapons, poison gas, or other, are we prepared and would we respond in kind? We uh, have to be concerned about the possibility that he may have uh, chemical capability that he could marry up with his ballistic missiles. Uh, he's never previously used. Uh, ballistic missiles with chemical warheads on them, but uh, we have to assume he could. It's one of the reasons for the uh, elaborate alarm systems we've worked out, both in Saudi Arabia and that the Israelis have worked out, the protective gear that our troops are, are equipped with, uh, etc. Um, in terms of uh, how we might respond were he to use chemical weapons, uh, I would simply reiterate what we've said previously, which is that the United States has a broad spectrum of capabilities available, that uh, the President uh, would make the decision about how we might respond to an unconventional uh, attack by Saddam Hussein against U.S. or allied forces, and uh, I wouldn't want to speculate further. Could I ask you a couple of questions, first of all, about uh, the report of a coup attempt? Have you heard anything about this at all in the Iraq? Uh, nothing that would give me any uh, reason to believe it has cr great credence. And, so, and, and Mr. Rowe, General Powell, I have another question about the exosets. We, we talked about the silkworms being taken out, but you didn't say anything about the exosets, and many people think that's one of the most effective weapon systems he has. It was very effective in the Falklands mm -hmm. conflict. Have you done anything to take out the exosets? The Navy's working on it. They're, they're of limited range and uh, don't represent a very serious threat at the moment. Thank you. Uh, you were saying before that uh, with the coalition would uh, take as long as it had to, and yet you've outlined some goals that look like they might last long, that you said they, that you want to rip up the Air Force, yet they still have some 750 planes, and you wanted, said you wanted to shut up the Army with uh, cutting off its communications, which is still very <coughs> resilient, a very large army. The chemical weapon threat is still a, a threat to the Allied, and the Scud is still a weapon of terror for the Allies. Does that not like sound like it's going to last some time? Well, we've avoided consistently putting any sort of artificial deadline out there by which this whole operation had to be completed. Uh, we do not know how long it will, ta will last. Uh, those are the, the kinds of things you mentioned, our specific objectives. Uh, we will operate until we've achieved those objectives, and I simply wouldn't want to put a, a time frame on it. it uh, I, I can't do that. I don't know how long it will take, although I'm inclined to think, given the size of the force we've deployed and the success we've enjoyed to date, that um, it, will, uh, it won't take that long. But is the Allied force uh, patience going to outlast the patience of Saddam Hussein who's hunkering down? Which patience is going to outlast? Well, I'm, uh, there's no doubt in my mind, but what uh, the uh, United States and our allies in this venture have, uh, uh, have the staying power to see to it that the job gets done, that he will quit long before we will. Secretary Cheney, and actually General Powell, you're mentioning now that your main focus is the Republican Guards. Does that mean at this juncture in the air campaign, you're pretty much sparing the troops right at the front line? No, they are, they are uh, under attack as well. We're, we're uh, selectively uh, uh, probing all of the for against all of the forces in the uh, Kuwaiti theater of operations. But because the Republican Guard is the Republican Guard, uh, they get more attention than the rest. What about the General, 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 Secretary General, 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 what percentage of the Scud launchers would you say have mobile and fixed have been destroyed, and how well are the Allies uh, on the way towards destroying the full Scud capability, so that the Saudis and the Israelis won't have to worry about that? I don't think you can put a, a hard percentage on the uh, amount of his capability that's been destroyed. We know he had a large number of missiles before this started. 
Um, the missiles are important, but the launchers are even more important. We know we've been able to uh, attack successfully many of the fixed sites. Uh, we continue to work on those fixed sites. We know he's got mobile capability, but we have some confidence we've destroyed some of that mobile capability. Uh, but it's a, it's a nebulous kind of thing. Uh, they're relatively small pieces of equipment. Uh, they can hide uh, in the desert, they can come out at night uh, and launch. Uh, it doesn't require any great degree of sophistication uh, for them to be able to operate. And it's one of those problems that may be with us for some period of time and that it's a matter of, of uh, reducing the odds as much as possible, going aggressively after his launch capability, but also defending uh, the targets, uh, which is why we've deployed Patriot both in Saudi Arabia and Israel. Who fired, who fired, who fired, the, who fired the Patriot? Uh, that apparently hit or didn't hit the scud that did the damage in Tel Aviv yesterday. Um, idea. Why, why did they do it instead of the U.S. crews? Well, they were either one could have done it. Whoever was in position, the U.S. crew was working with a power problem, a generator problem they had at the time, and IDF got acquisition and uh, fired. Did that Patriot hit the scud? Uh, I really would prefer to defer to the IDF to to uh, comment on their actions. I'm just passing on a report I heard. Secretary, just going back to an earlier line of questioning, what is your view of the uh, argument that, in fact, if Saddam Hussein's strategy is simply to stretch this war out as long as possible, forcing the Allied troops into a long, bloody ground war, he's uh, enjoying some success in that. Well, how, how do you view that, and uh, is there anything you can really do if he continues to husband his resources as he's been doing? Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm not a military strategist um, to the extent that um, my colleague General Powell might be, but looking at it uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, U.S. forces versus Iraqi forces, he really hasn't got much choice at this point. I mean, he is uh, pursuing a strategy, uh, perhaps of necessity. Uh, if he comes up with his air forces uh, in significant numbers, uh, I think we'll see uh, the kind of ratio that uh, Colin talked about in terms of 19 to 0 or 19 to 1 uh, on his entire Air Force, and, and he would lose it and, and gain very little for it. Uh, he doesn't have any significant naval capability. Uh, he's really left with a very large army. That's always been the heart of his military strength, and his success in the Iran-Iraq war was to dig in and hunker down and defend against the human wave assaults by Iranian teenagers. Uh, that's not the kind of situation he's faced with today, and I think uh, the reason he will not be successful with a waited-out strategy is that uh, as long as he is sitting there waiting, we are steadily and progressively destroying his uh, unconventional warfare capability, uh, finding and destroying his Scuds, taking out his Air Force piece by piece, and now, uh, as the chairman pointed out, uh, aggressively working over his ground forces in Kuwait. Uh, I think time is clearly on our side, and that given our dominance in the air and our capability to do significant damage to his ground forces, that each day, each week that goes by, he gets weaker and we get stronger. But your, goal, you stated your goal, though, is to get his troops out of Kuwait, and in fact, while this pummeling continues, his troops remain still reasonably intact, uh, which suggests that uh, it's inevitable that uh, he will draw the Allies into a ground war. Well, we may eventually, and I'll defer to uh, General Powell and General Schwarzkopf, uh, they'll have to come back and advise me and the President on when various pieces of the campaign kick in. But uh, if we do have to go to using our ground forces to push him out of Kuwait, it will be after we've done enormous damage to his ground forces, uh, after they've been significantly weakened. And uh, I think uh, our People have the same capability on the ground to display the kind of mastery over Iraqi forces that they've displayed in the air today. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the aircraft that uh, you're showing us as destroyed on the ground, are those confirmed wreckages, or are you including in that any estimate of well, the ones I'm showing you? The ones I'm showing you are confirmed. And we had a, a couple of more confirmed as we were walking down here. And as the BDA gets better and as the attack progresses, that number will will go grow. We're not doing away. estimates, and and we're we're trying to be as forthcoming as we can. I'm not down here to give you happy talk. I'm trying to give you my best assessment as I know it now. Don't know how long the war will take. 
uh, it's a war. Uh, I don't think we've done badly for seven days, and I don't think we're any, by no means uh, bogged down, uh, and we'll try to give you as much information as we can. And we'll give you that which we can yeah. confirm. What we can't do is, is try to keep up with the hourly news cycle. That's, that's causing us a great deal. The, the map that you showed us, is that the radar coverage that they had on the first day of yes. the war or as of three hours ago? It was, it was a... It was We're going to break away now. There's Arthur Kent in Dahran, Saudi Arabia. Arthur, have you had more Patriot missile firings? Tom, yes, with uh, very little warning, uh, we had about 30 seconds of siren warning uh, before two Patriot missiles were launched. And uh, avoiding collateral. Were, were intercepted just in front of us, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps about a mile up range. And uh, very clearly I could watch as the uh, remains of both the uh, uh, incoming Scud, both the Iraqi missile coming in and the Patriot that intercepted it came down in a, in a very, very uh, straight and fiery, fiery ball down to the earth here. Uh, the very loud detonation when it... All right, I don't okay. know General, 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 Thank you. Iraqi Scud in. We said before, so there's no misunderstanding, we deal with this information as it comes in. Air raid sirens sounded in Dharan and Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Oh, and our play in just a second. But is Sam Donaldson standing by in eastern Saudi Arabia? Let's go straight to Sam Donaldson. Yeah. Sam, what's cooking? Yeah. Peter. Go ahead, Sam. Rick, get out of my ear, Rick. Get out of my ear, Rick. Peter, are you there? I am, Peter, Sam. Are you there? I am, Sam. Go well, ahead. Yes, you're looking, you're looking at the uh, night sky here in Dharan. We were under a scud attack at the very end of that briefing as uh, Cheney and Powell were talking. At least five uh, of our uh, own rockets went up, and we heard two very loud explosions, intercept explosions. But one of the explosions, and I'm going to be very careful about this, on the other side of the hotel where I'm standing, sounded like it was very low to the ground. Whether that was an intercept... Uh, uh, low to the ground, or whether in fact this. We may have just taken. We have information. Very low detonation. We have information that there are sirens also at the Saudi capital of Riyadh. But to recap, over the last several minutes, the airbase in eastern Saudi Arabia, the airbase here in eastern Saudi Arabia, has been under attack over the last several minutes. Tonight being almost exactly one week since the war against Iraq began. Scott, we're going to take a slight break here and let you check around. I heard design for those of you uh, rising uh, nearby. Uh, we will not uh, attempt to fix any uh, closer than that, as you've indicated, the uh, location of the impact so as not to uh, send any information back to Iraq, which may de be detrimental. You know, it, it, it is true, Tom, that we've uh, been told from the early days of uh, this operation here, back in August after the occupation of Kuwait, that there are Iraqi agents here. They were able to penetrate the border of Saudi Arabia during the um, immigration of, uh, the mass migration, rather, of Kuwaiti refugees, and that there have been some sleepers put here, the Iraqi agents who have been able to... Tonight we may get another chance to see just how good these, uh, these patriots are. Dan? Tom, it was also mentioned that the Defense Department briefing that the uh, U.S. Patriot missiles in Israel were fired by Israeli crews. We have not confirmed that independently, but uh, General Colin Powell uh, indicated with uh, Defense Secretary Cheney there that the Israelis had fired the Patriot missiles. Some of the U.S. Patriots are manned by Israelis, some by U.S. troops. But we're um, monitoring the breaking story of the moment. Uh, Scott Pelley has more in Dharan, where U.S. Patriot missiles have been fired in the last few minutes. Scott, uh, what else can you tell us now, please? Dan, as we said a moment ago, we heard a very loud explosion that shook this location here. It sounded like a ground burst, and we can now tell you we see a large plume of smoke rising from that area. No fire, apparently, but we can see in the night sky a very large plume of smoke. It is very near the air base here in eastern Saudi Arabia, if it is not, in fact, on the air base. Dan? And noting, Scott, uh, that we do not know that that was a Scud missile lifted freight truck, and it's a highly complex electric that so let me play amateur here and play it off on you and also then come to Tony.
debris from the Scud missile. It could be uh, falling debris from the Patriot missile. We'll just be checking as we go along. We also want to note that U.S. military authorities have said and continue to say that the main threat from the Scuds in Saudi Arabia is more harassment and interdiction for the U.S. military than anything of any military significance. Now, as regards Israel, Tom Benton reports the sirens are going off once again in Tel Aviv. We have no indication of any firings, Scud missile firings or Patriot firings in Israel today, just the fact that sirens have gone off there. There is a school of thought that far too little attention is being paid to the continuing Scud missile threat in Israel um, and because this uh, is a case of Saddam Hussein delivering on his threats to Israel and he's fulfilled his pledge to hit Israel but no hits today. On the phone with us from uh, Riyadh is Lucy Spiegel, our CBS News reporter and producer there. Lucy and Riyadh, what's the situation at the moment? Dan, we've heard uh, several explosions. Uh, our cameraman up on the roof has seen two patri Patriots go up. Uh, we believe uh, that they caught one scud. We're not sure about the other, but there have certainly been a number of explosions and not too far from the hotel. Let's check in with David Martin at the Pentagon. David, uh, any word there? No, Dan, but you know, these uh, scuds are now fairly openly acknowledged and were so today by uh, Defense Secretary Cheney and uh, General Powell to be something they really hadn't uh, anticipated to be this much of a problem. They really singled out two things that have been more difficult than they anticipated. One was the weather and one was... That's, uh, that continues. Secretary Dick Cheney and General uh, Colin Powell, who is chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. When I say optimistic, I should tell you as well that uh, laced throughout all this was a note of very heavy caution and an indication, Fred, that this air war that has been going well by their definition. Well, we know some explosions there from what we don't know. We also have uh, an alert in Riyadh, some Patriots fired there. So we're going to go to Riyadh now with videotape and listen carefully, and you'll hear what Scott Bell and his crew heard a few moments ago. Let's play the videotape. We have explosions overhead. I think we may have just taken a hit or a very low detonation. Well, uh, that was Daron listening to uh, our own intercommunication unit to double check ourselves. Let's set the picture quickly. What you heard there was a videotape of the explosion in Daron after sirens sounded, belief that Patriot missiles were fired, explosions were heard. You might have heard on that videotape Scott Kelly saying we've heard this tremendous weapon capacity for the qualification on that with time. Okay, and the uranium can be stored away. When the Iraqis hit the uh, Osiris uh, reactor in 1981, I think it was, they left some uranium intact, right? There are 12.7 kilograms, which some people feel can be made into a nuclear device and others think is too sophisticated. It's very likely that that has been dispersed outside the area and is probably intact in an Iraqi hands. Chemical facilities, their emphasis on production facilities and the factory to put it into weapons, uh, considerable damage to both. What does that mean to us? Well, I think it's very important in affecting their future production, but as General Paul was very careful to qualify, and Peter, I would listen to his qualifications at least as much to the positive statements. It's clear that all of the basic stockpiles of chemical weapons have not been attacked. Those are thousands of tons of weapons that he retains all of the delivery systems that could encounter our forces as they advanced into Kuwait, and he retains the ability to use his aircraft uh, in some kind of last-ditch raids to launch large amounts of chemical bombs. I'll come back to the Air Force, if I may, but one more. There are biological uh, uh, facilities created quite a problem for them. That formula factory uh, was a biological target. He was very insistent on that, and we have, he said, taken it out. Well, I think that, again, we're talking production. We have to be careful that he probably has dispersed any of the weapons that he may have, so those will be intact. Uh, where on the outlying areas of Iraq or Kuwait has been hit. And uh, we had to admit that was a fairly good point. I think that uh, what's happened, though, that the White House has turned over really the detailed briefings over to the Pentagon, and the White House is very limited in what it can say. These are guidelines, these are rules that President Bush has set for his spokesman and for himself, which means that by and large, the White House can do a little more 
then talk in generalities, not banalities, but generalities. The president was speaking a little earlier this afternoon. He met with the uh, president of Mongolia. And at that time, the president was saying, listen, uh, the war... Uh, this Officers are still in control of their military. General Powell says they're very good. They haven't lost it. How does that affect the campaign? Oh, considerably. Uh, after all, uh, Saddam Hussein is setting the policy and his general staff is directing the defensive operations. And to do that effectively, they're going to need command and control. Now, the, the general staff knew about our air capability and uh, they clearly have set up a, a redundant command and control system so that if one system goes down, they can still uh, move to another one. And I don't think we can ever fully expect to destroy their command, control, and communications because even if we did it, it would only be temporary. They have uh, some very bright uh, electrical types there that can put the, uh, the operation back together by jury rigging. So the best we can hope, I think, is to degrade, certainly not to destroy the command and control. Both you and Tony Carter know the Iraqi army. One of the things that I think impresses Lehman is their ability to get things going again. Paint over runways at one point, he said, to make it look as if they are damaged. How accomplished are the Iraqis, do you think, in that regard? Oh, I think the Iraqis are very clever. Uh, you know, these, these are professional um, uh, officers running this show. Uh, they have studied uh, warfare in, in various parts of the world. The idea of, uh, of putting a false impression on an airfield uh, probably came from the Falklands campaign when the Argentinians did that to fool the, the British uh, airstrikes. So uh, they, these are people who are, in a sense, death de uh, desperate, uh, but they're determined and and then explain to us how the censorship works. Uh, Dan, the point of the censorship, of course, is to not to help the Iraqi gunners who are aiming these Scud missiles. Uh, they fire them off. They're highly inaccurate weapons, but they do aim them, and clearly they're aiming them in the general direction of Tel Aviv, and it would be helpful for them to know what they hit. That way they could correct their aim. So the censorship tries to... Uh, prevent the passage of any such information, particularly since uh, we're broadcasting and this can be picked up immediately. We're not allowed to say until the information has been released if we've heard any blasts, if we've seen any blasts, uh, where they hit and, and what the damage was. I think that's a fairly reasonable restriction considering the fact that we're sitting here in the target area. Tom, there will be some people who draw the inference, the inference that if you say you can't mention explosions, that may mean there have been some. Are we to draw any conclusions on the basis of what you have been able to tell us. I, you're putting me on the spot, Dan. Don't uh, mean to do that. Let me take you no, off the spot I'll right away. No, I'll tell you what. I, I, to be perfectly frank, uh, I'm not sure what we heard. Right. Thank you. We'll be in touch uh, there, Tom Fenton. Let's go back uh, very quickly with to David Martin at the Defense Department. David, what about the report on how the war has been going this far? What we're going to do is take a few seconds, let Scott Pelley in Dharan, where there has been an explosion, and obviously something has happened there in the way of an air raid. Patriot missiles were fired. We'll also be checking Lucy Spiegel in, in Riyadh, where Patriots have been fired. No uh, explosions have been heard, and we'll be staying in touch with Tom Fenton. But David, if you can, for just a moment, review for us very quickly uh, the lead of the Colin Powell and Dick Cheney briefing, we, we went through just about the time these uh, new Scud missile attacks were beginning. Well, Dan, I thought uh, General Powell gave the most succinct description of American strategy in this war that I've heard yet. He said, our strategy is simple. First, we're going to cut off the Iraqi army in Kuwait, then we're going to kill it. And what has happened in the first seven days of the war is mostly the cutting off part of the strategy, going after Saddam's eyes and ears, if you will, his radars, his, uh, his air defenses, his communications networks, with the extra added uh, target of his nuclear, chemical, and biological facilities. General Powell said here today something that has not been said before, that he destroyed two nuclear reactors. Uh, David, excuse me for one second. Uh, Dateline Jerusalem, Israeli radio, is quoted as saying that Israel is now under Iraqi missile attack again and that the Israeli army has ordered civilians to put on gas masks and to shelter in sealed rooms as a precaution. It has not been confirmed, but that's what Israeli radio says. The Associated Press reports out of Israel that no explosions thus far have been heard. 
Uh, let's go back to Tom Fenton uh, in Israel. Tom, are you there? And have you been monitoring Israeli radio? And what have they said in Tel Aviv? I have indeed. I'm a little bit ahead of you, Dan. They did, of course, tell us to put on our gas masks and go into the sealed rooms. They have now said the gas mask can be taken off. So presumably, uh, whatever it was, uh, it's, it's now over. Uh, let's hope that it's over for good for the day, but of course we, no one can say that. We want to put in italics, uh, big all caps and underscore, that despite reports elsewhere over the last few days, there has never been a chemical attack on Israel, nerve gas attack, or any of those things that have been reported elsewhere. The fact is that Israel has been hit by scuds, but all so far have had conventional weapons. Now, repeating that the Israeli radio has said, uh, from out of Jerusalem that uh, an Iraqi missile attack was underway. Tom Penton just says that in Tel Aviv, they've just cleared uh, on radio, said, well, you can take off your gas mask for at least the moment. Let's go back to David Martin at the Pentagon. David, we're monitoring the situation in both Dharan and Riyadh, but as we do so, I want to discuss for just a second what we know about uh, these fires at the refineries uh, in Kuwait. There's a growing body of thought uh, that these refinery fires, the big flames we saw yesterday, in which it was variously reported that Saddam Hussein was setting a fire, some of the oil for citizens in Kuwait, in fact, were not set aflame by Saddam Hussein, but were probably set afire by, by either debris coming from U.S. attacks or possibly set on fire purposely by the United States. Now, I recognize there's not much we know, but what factual information can you give us on that? Well, the short answer, I guess, Dan, is none. I do not know what caused those fires, although uh, yesterday uh, U.S. officials uh, were stating quite confidently and for the record uh, that the Iraqis uh, started those fires. I don't quite see the, the percentage in it for the uh, U.S. because, if anything, uh, those fires and the smoke they give off uh, are an impediment to any U.S. operations. They obscure the, uh, the sky and uh, make it harder for pilots to deliver their weapons on targets. And uh, General uh, Tom Kelly, the uh, director of operations for the Joint Staff, said yesterday that if there were enough of these fires, it might even force them to, uh, uh, to change the operation plan and, and uh, strike somewhere where they weren't to get around all that. So uh, it doesn't sound to me like it, it makes sense for the U.S. to see it from the hotel where we're standing, where the air base is. There was a very low, loud intercept type explosion, and a great number of emergency vehicles have now congregated. I can look across one of the runways, which is often used by our warplanes, and see that there are emergency vehicles congregated over there. I can't tell you what that means. Did the scud actually hit the ground? I don't know. Was it a low intercept and a lot of debris, as occurred in Riyadh just the other night? Mm -hmm. I don't know that. But I do know that it's something a lot more out of the ordinary than we've suffered from these scud attacks to date. OK, Sam Donaldson in eastern Saudi Arabia. Want to go to the White House briefly for ABC's Brit Hume. Brit, the Secretary of Defense said at the beginning of that briefing, um, you cannot score the war every evening. A clear allusion, I thought, to the television evening news, but I wonder uh, whether or not the White House felt any pressure to bring the country up to date at the end of seven days, or whether it was just a matter of course. No, I think, Peter, that there was uh, pressure felt by the administration to bring the country and us in the media up to date, uh, not just because of the feeling that we're entitled to the uh, information, but also because of the feeling that the news play, given the scud attacks and certain of the other aspects of the war, the political side of it, uh, was beginning to uh, uh, overbalance the uh, coverage given to the supposedly successful uh, military capacity. You're not the best source in this, and nor for that matter am I, but uh, the pressure isn't necessarily just from the press. In some respects, it's also come out of the administration, this sense of accomplishment itself, hasn't it? Well, I think that's true, Peter, although it, it should be remembered that uh, the, that first day's uh, exhilaration about the lack of U.S. casualties and the apparent success of all of those air raids was, uh, was immediately matched, or at least reacted to, by the president in right, right in this very room when he came in and said there should be no euphoria, this is going to take some time. And indeed, Peter, uh, the word you hear around here about the duration of this campaign is not weeks, mm -hmm. the word is months. Well, I was going to say that, uh, in fact, the secretary uh, this afternoon, I thought, may have put himself in a little bind when he said it won't take that long. 
What does that long mean at the White House? Uh, that was my first question when I heard him say it. What indeed does he mean by that? But I, I think that, uh, uh, Peter, if we're, we're trying to look at realistic uh, parameters for this in terms of the politics of trying to sustain support for it, we're probably t looking toward the hot months. Uh, toward the season of the year when it is extremely difficult uh, to hold forces together in the desert. And I think that that's the situation in which uh, this administration does not want to see its army uh, involved in fighting in that part of the world. Okay, Britt Hume at the White House, thank you very much. We should also point out the Secretary a little earlier had, uh, had hedged uh, on a number of things that quite logically one assumes, and he warned us all uh, that the Iraqi army may have surprises uh, for the U.S. or the Allied military in store. Now let us talk, if I may, first to Tony Cordesman again about the Iraqi army uh, in Kuwait. If I can go to my notes here, there was a quote there, Tony Cordesman, from General Powell, um, which some people will take certainly as pretty, uh, pretty terse. We have a simple strategy. Cut it off and then kill it. How complicated is that? Well, he went on to say it's very complicated. You know, a lot of people right now are asking whether the glass is half full or half empty. And what General Powell clearly said is we've just started pouring. We've changed from an air war designed to give us freedom of action in the air to one to allow us to kill targets in detail. And we're not talking now hundreds of targets, we're talking thousands. Many buried, many sheltered, and General Powell described each of the techniques involved. Our success rate is going to go down in terms of lethality per sortie because it's hard to kill individual tanks. It's hard to kill individual shelters when they're dispersed over wide areas. And he mentioned, Peter, the equivalent of 40 divisions. So I would think that we are going to see day after day of trying to kill not all of those targets, but a large enough percentage to either greatly reduce their military capability or even force them to give up. Now, Tony Cordes, uh, sorry, uh, General Trainer, a lot of us don't understand uh, those maps uh, when we look at them with their sort of veins coming down uh, through Iraq rivers and roads and, and rail lines all the way into Kuwait. Um, how easily can the Iraqis maneuver, say at night, in terms of getting supplies to their troops at the front? Well, of course, they would prefer to use their main roads, um, Peter, uh, but uh, they're adept, and the terrain, in many instances, allows them to get off the road. Now, it varies by area. If you're in the region which is, is very moist, particularly in the rainy season, you're going to get bogs. But other areas, the sand is hard, and you can get off the road, and uh, it's just like a, like a highway. So the business of interdicting, uh, that is cutting off as supplies going south prior to killing them, you know, it's, it's sort of like the uh, uh, admonition that you uh, buy, uh, buy low and sell high. It's, an, it's nice advice and it's a nice way to go about it, but the difficulty... One interception. Uh, two launches of U.S. Patriot missiles, one interception of a Scud uh, over Riyadh. Tom Fenton uh, in Tel Aviv, where the Israeli radio has been saying for a few minutes that Israel was under a Scud attack. Tom? Dan, uh, Israeli radio, of course, is the official uh, means of communicating alerts. Uh, but what uh, the Israeli radio said was that uh, we were under an alert for a gas attack. We were to put on gas masks, go into the sealed rooms. That alert has now uh, ended for the northern part of Israel. But for the Tel Aviv area, we've been told we can take off the gas mask, and, but we should remain in the sealed rooms. Uh, there has been some sort of activity, and, uh, but it's not so much a problem of censorship right now. I'm not sure myself exactly what has happened. But as soon as something is released, We'll get it to you immediately. And for our viewers and listeners, we want to underscore that we try to pass along the most accurate information we have at any time. And when I said before that Israeli radio said that Israel was under a Scud missile attack, that was the Associated Press quoting Israeli radio in Jerusalem. Tom Fenton, of course, in Tel Aviv. Let's check with Wyatt Andrews at the White House about continuing contacts between the United States uh, and Israel. Wyatt, we know that uh, President Bush uh, spoke uh, to the Israeli uh, top leadership during the night. Now we have another series of attacks, and whether any scuds actually hit Israel or not, you have another scud alert at a very and away and over warfare attack against these countries. We want to show you why that is a concern as well as in Saudi Arabia tonight. This is a videotape of an incident that occurred about 25 minutes ago. An incident seems like an understatement. This is a Scud missile attack at Dahran. Patriot missiles being fired from the base there. I have to stand by to find out. Yep. 
Here we go. There we go. There goes the paint trip. We're up. We're up. It's gone out here. That's two. And a detonation, a hit. And here comes the remains. Here comes the remains. It's coming down. This is the remains of a Scud missile. And it's impacting. And a second impact up here. A second interception up here. Yeah. Okay. We uh, want to tell you as a result of that impact that you can see flashing in the background. Now the chemical warfare alert has gone on in the Daharan area. People have been told to go to the bunkers as well. And we're about to show you NBC's Arthur Kent now, who is still there. But he has been instructed to put on his gas mask. And so he's going to report to us on what the situation is there. Arthur, tell us about the sensing devices in the military complex. They must be very swift. So shouldn't you get a report before too, too long? That's right, Tom. We've got our own sensing uh, devices, although very crude they are here. But this detector tape is not showing the red splotches, which would indicate to us the presence of any chemical agent. Again, it's the, uh, it was the incident of the impact of the remains. We believe the remains of the scud because we think it was hit very nearby that has this uh, additional alert being brought to us now. All right, are sirens continuing to be sounded there? Sirens are still sounding, and now we have a search helicopter taking to the air here. It will be going around the perimeter of the airfield looking for remains. You'll, uh, pardon me, Tom, if I take a deep breath every now and then, but uh, these masks are uh, not made for long distance running or talking. They're very difficult to uh, right. catch your breath there a minute. Naturally catch in. your breath there a minute. I'm working under uh, much better conditions at this end quite obviously. Uh, that is NBC's Arthur Kent in his gas mask because there has been a chemical alert put up at Daharan in Saudi Arabia. There has been obviously the most significant impact yet of a Scud missile. We believe that most of the damage was done by a Patriot missile that intercepted it but at a relatively low altitude. There is not very much time for those Patriot missile batteries to get off their shots at those incoming scuds that uh, fire that come in at about the speed of sound and uh, that means a little more than 700 miles an hour it takes them only five or six minutes from their position somewhere in Kuwait or in Iraq to get out over the skies of Saudi Arabia the intercept apparently was successful but as we saw last night in Tel Aviv uh, you can still have a successful intercept and a significant amount of damage on the ground we expect to get an assessment of what is going on there momentarily not only from Arthur Kent but from other people at the scene uh, I can assure you that that is a place where there will be a lot of military personnel in chemical suits and also in their gas mask and they'll be able to very quickly determine whether or not there's any danger from chemical warfare NBC's Arthur Kent, that's not going to give the Pentagon any feeling of a... ...and may have been quite, quite a blast. We have some videotape shot just a few minutes ago, just as that explosion was heard. Scott there you heard the explosion, Dan, a very loud explosion here, the loudest we've heard yet. Unknown whether it was possibility a possibility of a scud strike or perhaps the explosion of a Patriot missile very low to the ground. Dan? An all clear is sounding in Tel Aviv. Let's go to Tom Fenton there. Tom? Dan, we have the all clear now. That means that all of Israel is, is out of uh, an alert for the moment. Uh, we still have no information on exactly what happened. Uh, something did quite clearly and we're waiting for an official report. We'll get it to you as soon as possible. Everyone will be keenly waiting to see uh, whether the Patriot missiles function again, and if so, uh, they were successful. Last night, as we now know, a Patriot missile did score a hit on an incoming Scud, but nearly, it was a near hit, an explosion next to it, but just knocked it off course, and of course knocked it into a neighborhood where it devastated uh, a number of buildings and injured some hundred persons. Has it been confirmed in Israel, Tom, to your knowledge, that uh, Israeli gunners were uh, at that particular Patriot missile installation, as the U.S. Defense Department now says? 
Uh, so far, we, the uh, Army Spokesman's Office has been refusing to uh, give us any details on it. I think there was a lot of toing and froing between the Israeli Army headquarters and the Pentagon uh, over the last 24 hours of, about over who did what, uh, particularly when it first seemed that the, the missiles had totally missed their target. It's, no, it's not clear yet, except that the Army has said that at each of these sites there are Americans along with the Israelis. In Israel, the all-clear sounds. We do not know whether any scuds have hit in Israel. We have to await uh, the release of Israeli censorship and more details. Let's go to Riyadh, where at least one patriot uh, has been fired. We believe two have been fired, and it's believed that one patriot hit a scud. Lucy Spiegel is there. Dan, they are now sounding the all-clear signal here in Riyadh. Uh, we have not seen any activity on the horizon for at least 10 minutes, so that's it for the moment, we believe. Was there at any time any warning of possible gas, chemical weapons, uh, in Riyadh as there was in Dharan, was there? Not, not at all, Dan. Uh, we've had no word of any kind of uh, chemical or poisonous gas. We're just told, uh, Dateline Saudi Arabia, that the latest word from Saudi radio is that people may take their masks off. The uh, warning said that people should keep their masks handy, however, and earlier warning had been for masks to be donned. Of course, this has become, uh, w one doesn't want to say routine, but it's become uh, usual because Saddam Hussein is known to possess chemical weapons and biological weapons. So far as anybody can determine uh, in this war, none have been fired on the warhead of any scuds. But uh, as a precaution, uh, the Saudi radio, as is the case with Israeli radio, sometimes says don your gas mask strictly as a precaution. Also want to note that what seems like gas coming out from a scud missile hit, sometimes in the past it turned out to be toxic fumes from the burning body of a scud. So you just want to have that in mind as we go along. Let's go back to David Martin at the Pentagon. David, where are these missiles coming from? It's obvious that they're coming from a, a lot of different directions over the past seven days. Well, at the briefing today uh, given by Secretary of Defense Cheney and General Powell, this map was used uh, for a number of illustrations, but it, it tells you exactly where the uh, scuds are coming from. Iraq is outlined in black here. This shaded area here, this is Kuwait, this is Saudi Arabia here. This shaded area here is where the Scud missiles that are uh, incoming to Saudi Arabia are being launched from. They're mobile and they can move around within this area, which is of course what makes them uh, hard to hit. Uh, most of these uh, attacks occur at night, uh, obviously because it is easier for the, uh, the Scud launchers to move around at night. Uh, and get a shot off before they are spotted by American aircraft. Now, the, the scuds that are threatening Israel are being fired from western Iraq over here. This is Jordan here, and Israel, of course, is further uh, west. And again, you can see it's a, a fairly uh, large size area. That uh, roughly looks like about 100 miles uh, in length there. Uh, in which these uh, scuds can roam around, uh, hide out during the day, and get them off. And this is, this is consuming a major amount of uh, the American air missions. I've, I've heard uh, uh, figures of up to one-third of the, uh, the missions are now being flown in search of these scuds. Now, that clearly was not in the original battle plan. Assets, air assets, are having to be taken off other targets and sent looking for these scuds because although <clears throat> they can, as, as uh, briefers here repeatedly say, they cause only minor uh, military or insignificant military damage, uh, they can cause a lot of political damage, particularly in Israel, if they upset this uh, coalition against Saddam Hussein. And David, as someone pointed out, it's a, like, a little like telling someone in an airplane to find 10 pickup trucks in Texas or 10 uh, dog sled teams in, in Alaska. It's easy to give the orders, but difficult to, to affect them. Scott Pelley uh, in Dharan, we're going to be getting off the air uh, fairly soon, but bring us up to date on the situation there. Dan, we have the all clear here. The attack is over for the moment. We heard several explosions. No word yet on damage or injuries quickly all clear sounded in Israel unclear yet whether any scuds uh, hit in Israel today Israeli radio said there was a scud attack that was a uh, no, no. explosions uh, heard on the ground in Dharan what they were about no one knows
fired there. Two Patriot missiles believed fired at Scuds in Riyadh. One Patriot reportedly hit one Scud. None of that has yet been confirmed. In today's Pentagon briefing, Defense Secretary Cheney and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Colin Powell, uh, both cautioned the public not to expect too soon. Uh, this is a Riyadh, Saudi Arabia videotape just in. You'll see a Patriot go up. Let's listen and watch. Well, that's all there was. And sometimes that's the way it is on videotape replay. But if you were looking very carefully there, you could see just the quick little flash of light as a Patriot went up in Riyadh is believed to have hit a scud. Coming up next on this CBS station, we'll, of course, be on the air with any developments uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, your early local news will have details of the war. The CBS evening news will have complete coverage and a program note tonight at 8, 7 central time, will be a special edition of 48 Hours, which will give you not only the late developments, but some perspective, context of the war, uh, and give you some texture of, of war. Five, nine, East. That note, a special edition of 48 Hours tonight at 8, 7 in the Central Time Zone. For now, Dan Rather, CBS News. During the Pentagon briefing over the past half hour or so, you heard Defense Secretary Dick Cheney and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell, go through a lot of the elements that have been going on in the Persian Gulf since the start of the conflict a week ago. You also heard the name of the man who uh, is in charge of all the operation in the Gulf region itself, General Norman Schwarzkopf. He was mentioned a couple of times. Well, there was a pool interview today with uh, General Schwarzkopf, and we want to bring you some of that right now. How important is it militarily and politically? Um, militarily, it's unimportant. Uh, as, as I think we've clearly seen so far, the Scud is nothing more than a terror weapon. It has no military significance. Uh, and if it's continued to be used the same way it's been used in the past, it absolutely has no military si significance at all. Politically, uh, frankly, it shouldn't have a significance. I, I think that, unfortunately, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's taken on more significance than it should. Obviously, no one likes to have their country attacked by anything, and no one likes to feel that their population is in danger. Um, and, and I'm not being the least bit facetious when I say this, uh, but, but saying that scuds are, are a danger to your nation is like saying that lightning is a danger to your nation because that you know I frankly would be more afraid of standing out in a lightning storm in southern Georgia than I would be standing out in the streets of Riyadh when the scuds are coming down if it's going to hit you it's going to hit you but the percentages are so much less but 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 obviously uh, so long as as Saddam Hussein has the capability of launching uh, anything into another country and, as, and, and endangering the population, it's going to be a, a politically important question to that government, and I think we just have to accept that. Uh, I, I would tell you that, uh, that I am far more concerned about his Air Force, for instance, than I would be about uh, the Scud missile, because their Air Force has a, a precision capability, and therefore that becomes, to me, more of a danger than the Scuds do. Obviously, we want to completely eliminate his Air Force. Uh, I, I could never predict that we will completely eliminate his ability to launch mobile missiles. It's, it's as I explained, the nature of the problem before. Now, on the Air Force, uh, we're told that you haven't been able to knock out all that many because they won't fly and they're sitting in heavily protected bunkers, is that correct? And yes. so, how can you deal with this problem? He's still got something like 500 aircraft, at least I, I, 500 yeah, aircraft. I, I don't there. think we know how many he is. We, we've attacked many, many of the shelters. Uh, we continue to attack many, many of those shelters, uh, and you know you don't know what you do inside. First of all, you're not quite sure what's in there, and secondly, you don't know what you do when you're in there. But uh, eventually, we're going to destroy his air force. It's just that simple. If he leaves it on the ground uh, forever, then eventually we'll destroy it on the ground. Uh, if he, in fact, chooses to come up in the air, then we're going to destroy it more quickly. Uh, but we are. It's, I think it's important for you to understand that we have a continuous defensive posture, uh, where we have AWACS continuously in the air. And we have an air cap continuously in the air, interceptor cap, that is prepared to intercept his air force in the event they attack. And we have, of course, the Patriot missiles and the Hawk missiles and integrated air defense system on the ground. And, uh, 
and we're not letting down our vigilance. We're only one week into this campaign. We're not sitting back, resting on our laurels, say, well, since he's not flying, he's obviously no danger at all. As a matter of fact, we're taking it quite seriously. Uh, the danger of the fact that he will attempt sometime to mass uh, his air force and make an attack. Uh, when that happens, uh, we plan to be ready, and uh, we plan to take him on. Well, let's find out what's been happening on Wall Street today. With about uh, 19 minutes left before the markets close, the stock market is up 14.36. 154 million shares changing hands so far. We are going to uh, Jeannie Moss in New York at the United Nations. We are getting word of a request for a Security Council meeting. Let's find out exactly what we're hearing. Jeannie. That's right. There is a formal request now for an urgent meeting of the U.N. Security Council. It's not clear when or even if uh, that meeting will actually take place. The request has come from five northern African Arab countries. They are Mauritania, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. Now, most of those countries are countries that have at least um, sort of sided with Iraq. Morocco is a major exception. Morocco has good relations with Iraq and the Arab countries, but it's also sent 2,000 troops of its own over to the uh, multinational force, so it's kind of more in the middle. Now, these countries have asked for a meeting, but as we understand it, they haven't quite decided among themselves exactly what they want to accomplish. They do know that they would like to uh, vent their frustrations and air some views at an open meeting, but we're not sure where it's going to lead. You have to understand that with these countries in particular, they're having a lot of trouble at home. There have been demonstrations. The, some of the Arab masses are upset at the United States. They uh, aren't uh, thrilled that Saddam Hussein has taken Kuwait, but they think Israel is the real culprit there, and so there is some support for Saddam, and there are a lot of demonstrations and problems at home for these countries. So they have asked for a Security Council meeting. Any member has the right to do that. We do expect all 15 members of the Security Council to meet behind closed doors, possibly tomorrow. The question is, where th will there be a public formal meeting? And that uh, is less clear. A U.S. official tells CNN that he doesn't see much support in the council for having a public meeting. The U.S. doesn't want a meeting. It doesn't want the Security Council to get uh, mixed up in this in something that basically it's already authorized, this military action. And the U.S. and its allies don't want discussion of a break in the bombing so that more diplomacy can be tried. This is something the U.S. doesn't want. And there are procedural things that can be done to kind of head off a public meeting. So it's not clear now which side, the side that wants to have a meeting or the side that doesn't want to have a meeting, who has the votes. Uh, but uh, the, uh, some members of the council feel that it is important to have a meeting. I'm Jeannie Mose reporting live from the U.N. Jeannie, we're getting word that Iraq is in touch with a number of U.N. organizations. What are you hearing about this? We have heard only that uh, Iraq has communicated with two U.N. organizations that would be agencies, UNICEF and the World Health Organization, and they have asked apparently for a mission to be sent from the U.N. to investigate the need for food supplies and medicine. Now, all along, uh, Iraq has not asked for anything from the U.N. in this line. Um, the U.N. resolutions that uh, put sanctions against Iraq do allow for medicine to be sent over and they allow for food to be sent over in certain humanitarian situations but uh, it's supposed to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis this is the first time that iraq is apparently asking for the u.n to take a look and possibly uh, take some action on food and medicine apparently there are some shortages over there and it's something that the u.n sanctions committee will have to now consider all right jenny most of the united nations thank you we our coverage of the war in the gulf will continue after this One in four adults faces the risk of heart disease from high cholesterol. A diet low in saturated fat and cholesterol with new Fleischmann's Extra Light can help change those odds. Fact is, no leading spread is lower in saturated fat. Another fact, zero cholesterol. And on top of everything, it tastes good. New Fleischmann's Extra Light. What would it take to get you to change from Advil or Tylenol? How about something new from Bayer? New Bear Plus with Stomach Guard. It's got it all. Bear Plus has Bear Aspirin for powerful pain relief. To bang back headaches, muscle aches, and minor arthritis pain. And New Bear Plus has more. Stomach Guard to help prevent stomach upset. So bang pain back with New Bear Plus. 
The wonder drug worth changing to. It's tough on pain, gentle on your stomach. What's your name? Where are you from? A lot of questions. She's changed her name. Her looks. Her life. <laughs> All to escape the most dangerous man she ever met. Her husband. Where is she? This is our last chance. I can't live without you. And I won't let you live without me. Julia Roberts, Sleeping with the Enemy. Rated R. Starts Friday, February 8th at theaters everywhere. Have you ever seen someone when they come out of a salon? They're happy and they look great. That's because they feel beautiful. Think about it. Hairstyling is creating beauty. People looking their absolute best. Uncovering beauty and enhancing it, that's style. To get that, start with a professional hairstylist. Take their advice and use Paul Mitchell products. Paul Mitchell products are guaranteed only when purchased in beauty salons. I want to bring you up to date on uh, what happened about uh, 20, 25 minutes ago. We told you about the air raid alert in Israel, but we have new information now that has been cleared by Israeli censors. We are told now that one Scud missile, one Iraqi Scud missile, was fired to the northern part of Israel. We are also told that Patriots were fired. We do not know how many Patriots were fired, but that they were indeed fired. And we are told also that there was an intercept. That is all the information we get that, as I said, was cleared by Israeli censors. Dave? From the uh, British pool, we go to Mark Austin right now with an interesting look at exactly how aircraft is refueled in midair. Let's take a look. It's big, and at least to the men who fly it, it's beautiful. This is the forgotten flyer of the war. Clear takeoff on 30, Canopus 21. It's an RAF Victor tanker, the petrol station in the sky that keeps the fighters and bombers airborne. The crew's task, one of precision to arrange a rendezvous with the thirsty jets over friendly territory and make sure they're at the right place at the right time. Head north. Knowing that, that seems just as easy to me. Right downwind then, couldn't we? Here, RAF ground attack planes queue up for fuel to enable them to complete long-distance missions. The exercise of taking aboard more fuel is itself an exacting test of flying skill. And it's an exercise now being repeated dozens of times a day over the Gulf. Three, two, one, and contact. Good man. Great stuff. The most difficult time really is when you take a group of receivers out, maybe four or six or eight, and uh, they don't all come back. That's the hardest time up there really. Uh, hopefully you always hope that maybe he's gone to another tanker and often that is the case the problem is not only are you waiting for them but that you've then got another two hour flight or so back to base until you can actually find out so it's not an easy time but it's one we've uh, we've got used to living with unfortunately well of course peacetime uh, it's just a flying petrol station uh, and perhaps we don't necessarily get all the uh, the credit and kudos that uh, other aircraft get but I can tell you for certain that uh, in the past few days, uh, the receivers, whether they be tornadoes, Jaguars, or whoever, are very, very grateful to see the tanker when they come off the attack. With more than 20,000 gallons of fuel aboard and no real protection of its own, it always stays in friendly skies. Much of the victor's work is done at night when many of the bombing raids take place. It means the Victor's crew are among the busiest in the air war, refueling not only RAF jets, but sometimes other Allied planes as well. With almost every mission flown in the Gulf, the tankers play their part, a crucial role in the Allied bombardment of Iraq. Mark Austin, ITN, with the RAF in the Gulf. Hello. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm having a dinner party and I've run out of coffee. Come in. Thank you. Would the uh, tasteless choice be too good for your guests? Oh, I uh, think they could get used to it. Could they? Yes. Savor the sophisticated taste of taster's choice. Have you met your new neighbor yet? Oh, I've uh, popped in for coffee.
Recently, DuPont announced that its energy unit would pioneer the use of new double-hulled oil tankers in order to safeguard the environment. The response has been overwhelmingly positive. DuPont, better things for better living. Poor thing, you've got a real miserable cold, huh? Well, you could take Sudafed for your stuffy nose, plus Chlortrimeton for your sneezing, plus, yep, there's more, plus regular Tylenol for your aches and pains, plus, why are you looking at me like that? Plus, Benalin DM for your cough. You don't want to take all these? Well, you can relieve all those symptoms with multi-symptom Comtrex. It's that simple. Just take Comtrex and you'll feel better. Comtrex, all alone, it does it all. I'm visiting my in-laws. I smoke. They don't. No bother. I've got Wrigley Spearmint Gum. That cool, clean taste is most inviting. When I can't smoke, I enjoy pure chewing satisfaction. If you're serious about whole grain, remember, Wheaties has it. These guys don't. Better get your whole grain. You better eat your Wheaties. Once again, the all clear sounded about 10, 15 minutes ago in Israel after another air raid alert. Let's go back to Tel Aviv now and Richard Roth. Richard? Uh, yes, this is the latest that we have on what occurred in the skies here over Tel Aviv. According to Brigadier General Nachman Shai of the Israeli Defense Force, one missile was fired from western Iraq here at Israel. And over the skies of Tel Aviv, we believe, or somewhere in Israel, two Patriot missiles were fired and a destruction of a Scud missile took place. And what we believe we saw in, from one of the vantage points in Tel Aviv was debris from that possible intercept scattered all over the area. We, uh, someone on Israeli radio, an eyewitness, uh, said that he saw two Patriot missiles fired. But at this point, the Israeli Defense Force says that the Patriot missiles may have done their job tonight. Unlike last night, and an Iraqi Scud missile was destroyed incoming somewhere in Israel. Richard Roth, CNN, reporting live from Tel Aviv. A few hours ago here at CNN, Peter Arnett in Baghdad filed a report about uh, some bombing, Allied bombing, upon what uh, he reported to be a baby food factory. And let's listen to that report. Yesterday, information ministry officials took me on a two-hour visit to a powdered milk factory uh, that makes actually infant, infant formula. And this was on the western outskirts of Baghdad. Uh, they said it was destroyed by American bombing. Now, CNN had visited this plant last August for a story on how Iraq was trying to beat the international economic embargo by producing more essential foods at home to make up for the loss. The factory at uh, Abu Ghraib had been constructed of aluminum siding. It was about four acres of land. The force of the explosions had torn the aluminum sheets from the steel frame of the factory and scattered them over the countryside. The steel girders that had been holding up the building were twisted and blackened, and the machinery inside was a molten pile. The intact signboard at the entrance of the factory read baby milk plant in English and in Arabic. An official said it had been producing 20 tons of powdered milk a day. It was the only source of infant formula food for children one year and younger in Iraq. Officials valued the plant at $150 million. They said it was destroyed in two aircraft missile attacks. One was at 5 a.m. in the morning of the 20th, and the plane fired two missiles. The other was at the same time the following morning. Four missiles were said to have been used in, uh, in both attacks. No one was injured, <coughs> excuse me, no one was injured, officials said, because the 300 workers had already finished their evening shift when the first raid had hit. Outside the plant is a large painting of President Saddam Hussein comforting a distressed child. It was unmarked by the air attack. Now that's the report that we heard from Peter Arnett just a few hours ago here at CNN reporting from Baghdad. Uh, just over an hour ago at the Pentagon briefing in Washington, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Colin Powell, had this comment about that report. With respect to their biological warfare facilities, we have uh, gone after those uh, and uh, uh, 
We've created uh, uh, quite a problem for them, I think. We have seriously damaged those facilities. There was a story earlier today about the infant formula factory. It is not an infant formula factory, no more than the Rabta chemical plant in Libya made aspirin. Uh, it was a biological weapons facility, of that we are sure, and uh, we have taken it out. And we will continue to seek out uh, any other facilities that we believe are involved in the uh, production of biological weapons. Peter Arnett of CNN was taken on a tour and told that was a baby food formula factory. And, of course, General Powell exactly said just over an hour ago it had been taken out. It was certainly not a baby food factory. Ralph. One of the pool reporters in the Gulf region, Eric Enberg, had the opportunity to do a report on the U.S. Army's 3rd Battalion as it was moving toward the front. Here's his report. One by one, the units of the American Army are pulling out of their rear bases and moving forward to new positions where a ground war could be launched. For days now, the few available roads have been thick with U.S. convoys, all heading the same way, north. For the 3rd Battalion of the 8th Field Artillery, called the Thunderbolts, the big move will begin at nightfall at the desert base that has been their home for five months. The trip north will take an entire day. There is an impromptu send-off. A lone American soldier, one of those who will stay behind, runs the length of the entire column carrying a flag. Adios. The convoy travels all through the night. The big howitzers swinging easily behind the trucks. The barrels lit with red lights to prevent collisions. 23 hours of travel brings them to their new base. Its exact location can't be revealed for security reasons. But we can say that if this unit has to engage the Iraqis, it won't have far to go. The unit commander, Lieutenant Colonel John Wood, says they're ready. We're in great shape. We've got uh, where we need to be on personnel and equipment. The uh, ammunition is uh, aboard. We're, we're ready to do the job we've been asked to do. The Thunderbolts spread out across rocky terrain that resembles more a moonscape than a desert. If the order to launch a ground attack comes, they know, their next move may likely be into combat. The 3rd Battalion's 155mm howitzers can throw a withering steel barrage to clear the way for infantry. But now, here at the secret assembly area, the guns and trucks are designed to look like harmless lumps on the sand. There are signs all around the newly arrived Thunderbolts that they are just one part of a massive buildup. A column of French troops, including self-propelled artillery and armored vehicles, rolls by their new position. American infantry units are also on the move in the area with their tank-like Bradley fighting vehicles. Field commanders say they are not under any pressure from higher-ups to launch their ground punch anytime soon. But evidence of a wind-up to a powerful punch is everywhere on the roads. Eric Engberg with U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia. For Viewer's Choice Pay-Per-View, the hottest movies and the biggest events delivered one at a time. This month, order Gremlins 2, the new batch. And the blockbuster hit, Dick Tracy. Visit the Curtis Mathis store in the Lakewood Plaza and experience the Curtis Mathis difference. Curtis Mathis televisions feature an exclusive six-year warranty on parts and labor, including the picture tube. Curtis Mathis offers free delivery. We'll professionally set up your television, show you how to operate it, and if it ever needs service, a factory-trained technician will come to your home. If you need a new television, visit the locally owned and operated Curtis Mathis store in the Lakewood Plaza and experience the Curtis Mathis... Let's talk about your car. What was going through your mind when you shot him? Can she keep her unborn child? When you do, 
He said I was. Can she face the outside world? You've been threatening to come home for years. Can she break the cycle of crime? He was arrested for selling narcotics. Ray Dawn Chung, Lolita Davidovich, and Rachel Tickerton in powerful true-to-life dramas, prison stories, women on the inside. ESPN brings you coast-to-coast -coast NCAA basketball. The action's outstanding. Everywhere you look, there's down-to-the-wire excitement. Unbelievable! Unbelievable! Awesome, baby! Sensational! Super! Enjoy key matchups in all the top conferences, from preseason tournaments through championship week shootouts. NCAA basketball on ESPN. This is CNN. Welcome back to CNN's continuing coverage of the war in the Gulf. Here's the latest. About an hour ago, Iraq launched another round of missile attacks against Saudi Arabia and Israel. Israeli officials confirm that one Scud missile was fired toward northern Israel. Patriot missiles were fired and intercepted their target. In Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, pool reports indicate two Patriot missiles intercepted an incoming missile. And in eastern Saudi Arabia, witnesses report several explosions and the apparent launching of two Patriot missiles. So far, no word on any damage. For more on what's happened during the past few hours, here's CNN's Al Hinman. The right hand side of the formation. Operation Desert Storm at the one week mark. Allied warplanes in flight after flight against Iraqi targets. Now with more than 10,000 combat and support air missions. We can conclude that Allied air forces have achieved air superiority over not only the Kuwaiti theater of operations, but throughout the entire theater to include Iraq. The chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff backed that up with a report card on the Allied military effort to date. The real measure of effectiveness is what has the Iraqi Air Force been able to do to interfere with Operation Desert Storm. And the fact of the matter is that after one week period of time, no Iraqi airplane has conducted a single ground attack against any coalition target. And with the one exception of perhaps one airplane that may have been down, the Iraqi Air Force has not been able to interfere with our air operations. General Powell said the Allies are now targeting what he says is a very vulnerable, but well-organized and well-supplied Iraqi army. However, Allied ground forces, according to the U.S. military, have yet to engage Iraqi ground troops in anything more than just limited skirmishes. Our strategy to go after this army is very, very simple. First, we're going to cut it off, and then we're going to kill it. The U.S. aircraft carrier Forrestal is scheduled to leave tomorrow, leave headed for the eastern Mediterranean, somewhere near Israel. Speaking to military families at the Mayport Naval Station, Vice President Dan Quayle talked of continued U.S. resolve. Our troops will have the best possible support in the entire world. They will not be asked to fight with one hand tied behind their backs. The Vice President reiterated the administration's goal of bringing all U.S. GIs home as soon as possible, but not until Iraq is out of Kuwait. There may well be surprises ahead for us. No one should assume that Saddam Hussein does not have significant remaining military capability. Al Hinman, CNN, reporting. We told you in the last hour about the air raid alert in Israel. Well, there was also one about the same time in Saudi Arabia. Charles, CNN's Charles Jaco is on the scene now and uh, brings us an update on just what happened there. Charles? Well, Ralph, it was almost exactly 55 minutes ago that it happened. Um, there were We were uh, up in the office workspace. People began uh, scrambling for an air raid alert, uh, running out here to the live shot location. We heard... Uh, a couple of explosions muffled off in the distance, what we thought were bangs off in the distance. Coming over here, there was a loud bang, uh, the force for which kind of moved us back just a bit. And uh, one of our technicians saw what appeared to be uh, some sort of fireball trailing through the sky and coming in uh, at some distance from here. We can't tell you distance or direction because of restrictions we're under. Uh, in terms of what the Saudis say, the Saudis claim now that there were two incoming Scud missiles intercepted by two 
Patriot missiles. U.S. soldiers we've spoken to say they heard three, maybe four Patriot missile launches. We're still trying to uh, correct those numbers. Now, we have some videotapes shot by the uh, British pool here that may show exactly uh, what happened here. You can see one explosion of some kind there. That appears to be a Patriot missile arcing skyward. Uh, going up into the night sky here in eastern Saudi Arabia. Uh, we're not quite sure what that uh, flash there was. That would appear to be, again, another Patriot going into the sky, and this is an assumption. There's the explosion, apparently another uh, secondary explosion, possibly of an intercept uh, of some sort. At least that's what we believe it was, without getting any further details. And then you can see something there falling toward the ground. Whatever it was falling toward the ground did impact. At some distance, it may have been just a flaming piece of debris from this. Uh, as had been reported from elsewhere in Saudi Arabia earlier in CNN, there had been rumors, and one knows how the rumor mill operates in a situation like this, uh, that Saddam Hussein in the next 24 hours was going to try some kind of strike. Well, um, we don't know if the rumors, in fact, had anything to do with one another, but we do know that there were apparently some incoming scuds and there were outgoing Patriot missiles. And from all we can tell at this point, because we have not, uh, our crews in the field yet have not reported back to us, from all we can tell at this point, the Patriots did intercept those incoming scuds, uh, as you saw on that videotape. That's uh, the latest we have from here. The attack occurred almost exactly one hour ago, and now everyone is sitting around waiting to see what might happen next. But right now, is very quiet here in eastern Saudi Arabia. Charles Jaco, CNN, reporting live from Saudi Arabia. Thank you, Charles. Let's get a view of what's happening now from the White House. And for that, we go to CNN's Frank Sesno. Frank. Well, Dave, I'm glad to hear it's quiet in Saudi Arabia. It's pretty quiet here at the White House as well. You know, this thing is beginning to settle into a sort of routine, a sort of pattern. White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater briefs each day. The president more or less goes about his business. He receives a number of intelligence and uh, military update briefings throughout the day. He also finds some time for other activities. Today, he hosted the president of Mongolia. He had brief remarks as the president uh, and he uh, parted company at the end of their meetings in which Mr. Bush made only a passing reference to Operation Desert Storm and the war, war, uh, the war in the Persian Gulf, noting that Mongolia was among the first countries to condemn Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and saying in reference to uh, democratic moves in Mongolia that the action of Iraq's dictator, the actions of one misguided, misguided man in the president's words, cannot obscure mankind's bright destiny of democracy and freedom. Tonight, President Bush will be addressing the Reserve Officers uh, Association here in uh, Washington. A short address, we're told. Mr. Bush has been working on the words himself. Uh, Marlon Fitzwater, the spokesman, says to put a personal cast on it. In those remarks, the president will again pass his judgment on Saddam Hussein and again condemn Israel's action, uh, I'm sorry, again condemn Iraq's actions against Israel. Frank says no CNN live at the White House. Thank you, Frank. Our coverage of the war in the Gulf will continue right after this. Well, we make tonight's news back in the States. It's going to be a gorgeous day to be flying up here and doing this job. Hello. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm having a dinner party and I've run out of coffee. From News Center 31, this is Newsbreak. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bob Larson. Coming up tonight on News Center 31 at 6, the war is now a week old, and while we're aware of what effect it's having on families and the military, what effect is it having on the farming community? Farm Director Colleen Callahan will have the story. Meanwhile, we'll have the latest on the support rallies in central Illinois. News Center 31 will bring you these stories and more tonight on WMBD-TV. I could sure use my tax refund now. With H&R Block's Rapid Refund, you don't have to wait. Great, but I'm a little short of cash right now. With Rapid Refund, you don't need any money. What's that? We file your federal return electronically with the IRS, and a refund loan is on its way to you in a matter of days. You don't need any cash because all fees are deducted from your check. Available whether H&R Block prepares your return or not. Now that's the way it ought to be. That's Rapid Refund from H&R Block.
I used to think maintenance problems were part of owning a four-wheel drive until I owned a Toyota 4Runner. I ski a lot in the wintertime, and so I travel a lot of hard roads. All the other four-wheel drives I've ever owned weren't reliable, and they had horrific maintenance problems. In the year and a half I've owned the 4Runner, all I've done was change the oil and rotate the tires. I got a great deal. I know I should have bought the 4Runner to begin with, but I had to travel the hard road first. Toyota. More for your money. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs on the Iraqi army. First we're going to cut it off, and then we're going to kill it. Iraq answers with another round of Scud attacks. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. Saddam Hussein fired another barrage of Scud missiles today. Saudi Arabia and Israel both were targets. U.S. Patriot missiles apparently knocked them all out. No casualties. The war is one week old today. Pentagon chiefs say it's going according to plan. They decline to predict how long the war may last. Defense Department correspondent David Martin is standing by at the Pentagon. He has the latest, David. Dan, one week into the war, U.S. and Allied bombers are starting to go after the Iraqi army in earnest. Despite all the drama of these Scud missile attacks, the object of this war remains to drive the Iraqi army out of Kuwait. And today, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff gave the most succinct explanation yet of how he plans to do that. Our strategy to go after this army is very, very simple. First, we're going to cut it off and then we're going to kill it. Until now, with the operation still in the cut it off phase, Allied warplanes have been topping off their fuel tanks and heading for targets further north. Everything from command centers to Saddam's Air Force. Although only 40 of Iraq's 800 warplanes have been destroyed, the commander of Operation Desert Storm says the Allies have established air superiority. We've uh, got his Air Force grounded, completely grounded. Uh, we have uh, when he comes up in the air, we shoot his airplanes out of the air. One other target has been Saddam's nuclear reactors, which would produce the material for nuclear weapons. But the two operating reactors they had are both gone. They're down. They're finished. Iraq claims the U.S. has hit civilian targets, including a baby food factory. The U.S. says no. It has a military garrison outside, and numerous sources have indicated that the facility is associated with biological warfare production. Saddam's defeat is inevitable, the Defense Department says, but no one is willing to predict publicly how long that might take. Privately, officials talk in terms of weeks. Publicly, they warn against overconfidence. There may well be surprises ahead for us. No one should assume that Saddam Hussein does not have significant remaining military capability. We have to anticipate that he will try to use that against us. To date, there have been two major surprises, one of them courtesy of Mother Nature. The weather turned more severe after two and a half days of operations than we had expected. As a result, a number of our planned missions had to be aborted. The other surprise has been Saddam's continuing ability to launch Scud missile attacks against both Saudi Arabia and Israel. We are finding that it has taken more of an effort on our part to go after those Scuds than we had anticipated. One other surprise the Pentagon worries about is an all-out attack by Saddam's Air Force against Israel or Saudi Arabia, sort of an aerial version of the 1968 Tet Offensive in Vietnam. Uh, most of the planes would be shot down, but a few might get through, allowing Saddam to claim a political victory. Dan? David Martin. The big Saudi Arabian air base at Dharan, a center of Allied activity, came under missile attack again today. Scott Pelley is there. Dan, we are still trying to determine the extent of the damage from the missile attack. The barrage began about 11 p.m. local time. It was the third night in a row of missile attacks. Above Dharan, missiles exploded and crisscrossed the sky in the worst attack on Saudi Arabia in the week old war. Here, a U.S. Patriot missile rises to meet an incoming target and detonates above the clouds. But a large piece of debris falls from the sky. There is an explosion on the ground. Smoke billowed from at least two places in the city. Explosions rumbled through the night. At this moment, we have the all clear, no attack underway, but clearly there has been damage. We do not yet know whether there have been injuries. Dan? Scott Pelley. 
Israel says its U.S.-supplied anti-missile shield worked well tonight. This was after last night when what the Pentagon says were Israeli gunners apparently hit a scud with a Patriot missile but succeeded only in knocking it off course. This time it was different. Tom Fenton is in Tel Aviv. Dan, CBS News has learned that the Israeli government has decided not to retaliate against Iraq for the moment. That decision was taken this morning and will undoubtedly be reinforced by the success tonight of a Patriot missile that knocked out an incoming Iraqi scud over northern Israel. The sirens sounded again tonight and the country was put on a poison gas alert. Decontamination units scoured the streets of Tel Aviv looking for debris of the missile that was down. There was relief that it wasn't a repeat of last night's devastating direct hit on a residential area. This morning, rescue crews were clearing up the damage. Residents returned to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives. Close to a hundred Israelis were injured. Miraculously, there were only three deaths. We pray to God every day. We, we, we get our life uh, like a prison. A stream of politicians turned out to inspect the damage and cheer up the hundreds who have been made homeless. The repeated missile attacks are taking a toll on people's nerves. Yesterday I was afraid and now I'm, uh, I'm more, I'm covered, I don't know what to say. But most Israelis are beginning to develop a siege mentality. If after 2,000 years Jewish people have to die here, not outside, if I have to die only here. One of the victims was buried here today, a 70-year-old patriarch named Abraham. He died of a heart attack when the scud exploded last night. The Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra rehearsed a special program with guest masks at the ready in their government-issued boxes. The country's favorite conductor, Zubin Mehta, returned to be in Israel in its time of crisis. But for the moment, no audience will hear this concert. All large gatherings are banned until the scud threat is over. And that could be a long time. Tom Fenton, CBS News, Tel Aviv. President Bush's day included a midnight phone conversation with Israel's Prime Minister Shamir. President Bush makes a speech about the war tonight. It'll be carried live by CBS. White House correspondent Wyatt Andrews has our report for the moment. Wyatt? Dan, the White House is officially now saying it will understand should Israel ever choose to retaliate for those scud attacks, but it's still true the president worked hard to convince Israel not to enter the war, and he did that by smothering the Israelis with praise and also with fresh assurances of new financial aid. The president placed a midnight phone call to Prime Minister Shamir in which the words were indirect, but the message was, hold back if you can. A spokesman quoted the president expressing how valuable Israeli restraint is, how helpful to the coalition. In fact, while the United States hopes Israel will hold back, it's also newly confident the Arab coalition would tolerate an Israeli counterstrike. Why would it hurt the coalition for Israel to retaliate? It might not, uh, it might not vary, but uh, the point is, uh, it's uh, something that uh, is uh, very much appreciated by the United States. The drumbeat of praise for Israel was overwhelming on Capitol Hill, where the House voted 416 to nothing in support of Israel's show of restraint. We're asking a lot of Israel, asking more than we probably would be willing to do. But Israel, in turn, is asking for more money. $13 billion to help offset the impact of war and the job of resettling Soviet refugees. There has been uh, an explanation of the very severe hardships Israel is uh, facing in the financial field and the economic field. The president today tended to other diplomatic chores, using a meeting with the president of Mongolia to define the Gulf conflict as an effort to stop a dictator. The actions of one misguided man cannot obscure mankind's bright destiny of democracy and freedom. Within the hour, President Bush plans to mark the one-week milestone of this war with a speech here in Washington that aides describe as his personal report card. Dan? Thanks, Wyatt. CBS News live coverage of the president's speech begins at 7.45 tonight, Eastern Time, 6.45 in the Central Time Zone. As the bombs rain down on Iraq, refugees are pouring out of the country, many of them frightened and angered by the U.S. air assault. Doug Tunnell reports from Jordan. 
Refugees streaming into Jordan say there are many more civilian casualties in Iraq than either the United States or Iraq has admitted. 2,400 Egyptian and Sudanese workers and their families arrived overnight with eyewitness accounts of a week of bombing by Allied warplanes. The jets were trying to hit electrical stations and telephone exchanges, Ramadan Mansour told us, but those places are in residential neighborhoods and sometimes they hit houses instead. When Allied jets bombed the oil refinery at Dora, just south of Baghdad, there were an estimated 500 workers on duty. There were many casualties there, Ali Abdullah told us. <laughs> Mamdoua Hamid Ibrahim is a Baghdad shoemaker whose son is today without a pair of shoes. His daughter Rasha says the apartment building and the restaurants in their neighborhood were destroyed by Allied bombs. The Iraqi government claims only 41 civilians have died so far, but everyone in the camp today believes many more were killed. Some Western analysts say the Iraqis may have decided to minimize the casualty count out of concern that high numbers of dead and wounded could lead to a public outcry in Iraq for a ceasefire. What's missing here are the Iraqis. Iraq's law prohibits them from leaving the country in time of war, and so they have been left behind, unable to flee the bombing even if they want to. The refugees say there is little food and no water back in their old neighborhoods, and they accuse the regime of giving no food to foreign workers. Many say they hate Saddam Hussein, but they hate George Bush even more. Saddam should have been hit by other Arabs, he told us. Better that than to be bombed by America. Once they reach Egypt, they will tell their stories again and again. They are tales of people caught between two sides in a terrible war, and they say both sides are wrong. Doug Tunnell, CBS News, on the Iraqi border. Straight ahead on the CBS Evening News, we'll tell you about ground fighting today and the big guns rolling north in Saudi Arabia. So stay here with us. <laughs> I am a car maker. Making cars friendlier to the environment is something I think about a lot. One answer is more fuel efficient cars. We're also working on alternative fuels, like our impact, designed to be the first really practical electric car with enough zip for the California freeways. 25 GM cars today put out the same amount of tailpipe emissions as one car from 1970. Now that's progress. Hello. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm having a dinner party and I've run out of coffee. Come in. Thank you. Would the uh, tasteless choice be too good for your guests? Oh, I uh, think they could get used to it. Could they? Yes. Savor the sophisticated taste of tasters' choice. Worse than they had planned for. Some missions had been canceled. Estimates of bomb damage have been affected. Now, as the war enters the second week, the weather is getting better. ABC's Bill Redeker is in Saudi Arabia. Ah, uh, just beautiful. Look, we're breaking out in the clear. There's one, two, and three. Yeah, this is going to work real good today. For the second day in a row, pilots reported good weather for combat. Yeah, target area clear, so uh, it looks like we're up for a good day here. Another 2,000 sorties were flown in the past 24 hours. That brought the total for the week to 12,000 missions. Okay. But only half of them involved combat. Approximately 6,000 were combat, and 6,000 were combat support, such as refueling and command and control. Because the Pentagon says 80% of the combat missions have been successful, it means pilots have hit or damaged their targets about 5,000 times. But air wing commanders and admirals at sea say that's not enough. Iraq has a huge inventory of military targets still to be destroyed. So we're getting what we're aiming at. The real ones we want to hit, we're hitting. Uh, and the ones we're trying to get, we're close, or close enough. But we have to continue to go back, to continue to take out the rest of it. I mean, there's just a lot out there. How much is still out there, the military won't say. Claiming that the weather is good enough to fly in, but not good enough to assess battle damage by satellite and aerial reconnaissance. Before the war began, the Air Force predicted the Allies would lose 25 planes for every 5,000 combat sorties. 
So far, the rate of loss has been lower than that. But the British have lost more than their share. Five high-speed, low-flying tornadoes so far. That's because their mission, attacking well-defended Iraqi airfields at altitudes as low as 200 feet, is among the most dangerous of the war. We obviously seem very confident, but we have the same emotions as any human being. And perhaps if you feel you're about to die, then you're scared. And Gary and I have both been very scared. On the Iraqi border, a two-day, two-night artillery and rocket duel sent Marines into their bunkers, where they too talked about the fear of initial combat, its sights, its sounds. I actually feel the first one, I actually see the first one. Uh, it's kind of scary, anybody that says no Lunch. At daybreak, the skirmish was over. Two Marines had suffered minor injuries. Six Iraqis had been taken prisoner on the Saudi side of the border. But it was only a skirmish. The war is still being fought almost entirely from the air. And that is not likely to change for a long time. Bill Redeker, ABC News, Saudi Arabia. We'll continue our coverage in just a moment. Everybody needs some money sometime. Everybody needs some cash somehow. Hello, dear. To send money fast, by phone, call 1 800 Call Cash or come to any of Western Union's. On long distance missions, converted C 130 tankers, flying gas stations. Somebody needs. Was it Delmark? Marine tankers were on duty just south of Kuwaiti airspace. Airstrikes are intensifying with improving weather, and more than 100 U.S. and Allied warplanes were operating within a 50-mile radius of this tanker. We're no longer in a training environment. The only thing one chance to do it right. And we're dealing with real lives here, so we want to make sure that it's done correctly. These airborne pit stops enable attack planes to refuel between strikes or to stay in the air for extended intercept or support missions. The tanker pilots have had a ringside seat to watch their combat-bound colleagues, whose wings are loaded with bombs and missiles destined for targets in Iraq and Kuwait. I would not want that mission that those guys fly because uh, they're down low, they're in the uh, AAA. Uh, it's a dirt mission and they've just done a dynamite job with it. It takes real, real courage. And it takes courage when things go wrong, too. The two-man crew of this British tornado ground attack plane ejected after guiding their disabled aircraft to a crash landing in the Saudi desert just after takeoff. A close call, but losses like this are not unexpected, with crew and aircraft flying to the limits of endurance. The big challenge now for U.S. and Allied Air Chiefs how to keep people and machinery performing at peak performance in an air war that is now likely going to take much longer to win than first expected. Tom? Thank you, Arthur. In a moment, other news. A major victory for anti-abortion forces in the information goes far beyond the bad weather the Pentagon says is hampering an accurate assessment of the air attacks. There's also censorship on all sides of the battle lines. It affects what you see and what you don't see, what you're allowed to know and not allowed to know, and in part is aimed directly at manipulating what you think about the war. Mark Phillips has prepared this report. Thus far, most of this war has been fought in the skies over Kuwait and Iraq. But there's another battleground, in the military briefing rooms and on TV screens around the world. Both sides fighting an information, a propaganda war. It's long been said that the first casualty of war is truth, but this war is special. This war has become one in which the public is being drowned in information. And to be able to watch 24 hours a day what's going on, and yet, at the same time, not actually learn anything must be pretty unique. Today's Pentagon briefing seemed at least partially designed to counter criticism that detailed knowledge about the success or failure of the battle has been a closely guarded secret. 
Still, Joint Chiefs Chairman Colin Powell's reference to drawings of bomb damage seem to illustrate the problem. Uh, I've laundered them, so you can't really tell what I'm talking about because I don't want the Iraqis to know what I'm talking about. But trust me, trust me. There are good reasons for the military to be careful. If it describes some targets as not destroyed, it's as good as telling the Iraqis we'll be back to finish the job, and they'll be ready. If the press says a Navy pilot is down, they'll be looking for our rescue operation. If reporters announce where an Iraqi scud landed, they can adjust their aim next time. You, the members of the press, have to understand that first and foremost, we must safeguard the security of future operations to protect the lives of those who will be asked to carry them out. But many are arguing that other harmless information is not being provided, that too often the briefings sound like this. I, I, I don't have any information on that report. I can't comment on that at this point. I, I'd have to refer you to the Saudis. What some see is the natural conflict between military requirements and the public's right to know how the war is being carried out in its name. It's the way we operate as journalists to be skeptical of what the government tells us, to ask for the proof. The problem is that without reporters in the cockpit, this war is being seen almost exclusively through the military's eyes, and it would rather we see the good news. We believe that it's gone very well. That optimism has been supported by selected video shot from planes and even rockets, but for whatever reason, little comprehensive evidence has been provided. The Iraqis, in their own unsubtle way, are feeding the world their own propaganda. Pictures of bruised prisoners designed to shape the resolve of an enemy they feel really hasn't got the stomach for this war. It makes the Allied military all the more cautious. The military's got very good reason to be afraid of the And one of the main reasons is that if the truth comes, as it did in Vietnam, that it can suck the public will at home to continue the fight. So some scenes from previous wars will not be repeated in this one. No pictures will be permitted this time of returning bodies. President Bush has promised that this war would not be another Vietnam, and he's holding to that promise, not only in the way the war is being fought, but in how it's being portrayed. Mark Phillips, CBS News, Washington. Texaco today became the third major United States oil company to announce a big jump in profits because of the Persian Gulf crisis and the war. Texaco said its fourth quarter profits jumped 35 percent. Mobile and Amoco announced large profit increases earlier this week. It is virtually impossible to get an official estimate of what the war is costing. U.S. Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady told Congress today that President Bush needs almost $80 billion more this year for the taxpayer bailout of ruined savings and loans. Brady said unless Congress approves some money, the bailout will have to be suspended March 1. Operation Desert Storm. How are Americans reacting to all of this news coverage from the Gulf? NBC's Jim Cummins. Despite the war, life is returning to normal in most places. Kids are in school, their parents are going to work. In Hollywood, tourists are back in...